Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Thanks for joining me today. My name is Judy Cho and I am board certified in holistic nutrition. I focus on root cause healing and oftentimes that's using the carnivore cure meat only elimination diet. Today, I am very excited to be sitting down and chatting with Dr. Paul Mason. For those of you that have been following a carnivore diet for a while, you probably have heard of Dr. Paul Mason. A Dr. Paul Mason is a sports and exercise medicine physician specialist. He obtained his medical degree with honors from the University of Sydney and holds a degree in physiotherapy and occupational health. Dr. Mason has an in-depth understanding of the latest science surrounding weight loss and nutrition, and he uses a low carbohydrate approach to help his patients achieve excellent results. Dr. Mason has a practice in Australia and also does virtual sessions. In our conversation today, Dr. Mason and I talk about a lot of the controversy and confusion in the carnivore ketogenic space. We talk about testosterone. We talk about SHBG. We talk about if we need carbohydrates for athletes. We talk about carnivore long-term. We also talk about dairy and we talk about thyroid function and a lot of other things. The biggest thing that we talk about in detail is about polyunsaturated fatty acids. He agrees that these seed oils and vegetable oils are not ideal for human consumption, but it is not because of the polyunsaturated fatty acids, not the PUFAs. In the discussion, he talks about the nuance of why these seed oils are toxic and why it may not matter as much about the animals that may have consumed these foods and that why it may be okay to be eating some grain-fed meats. I hope this conversation dispels a lot of the confusion in the meat-based carnivore ketogenic community because Dr. Mason is so experienced with the science, the evidence-based information, and from his practice of many, many, many years. Let's get right into the conversation. Hi, Dr. Paul Mason. I'm so very excited to have you on my channel. Thank you so much for joining me you are so well regarded. And so I'm excited to chat about so many little things and nuances in the carnivore community, some of the fears and concerns that come up. But before we do, can you just introduce yourself? Well, first of all, thank you, Judy, for inviting me on. I'm absolutely honored to be here. So I'm a sports medicine physician and I practice in Sydney in Australia. And I've got a strong metabolic interest in my practice. And I see a lot of people uh, with metabolic conditions and I see a lot of patients on a variety of diets. I see people coming in on vegan diets. I see people uh, coming in on carnivore diets. So I see the full spectrum. Oftentimes uh, we are told not to eat saturated fats because saturated fats raise our cholesterol and it's so bad for us and therefore we should be eating like the canola oils and the seed oils. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well absolutely. I mean first of all, that's just madness. I mean, there's no good evidence that shows that we should be having seed oils. Uh, I guess part of the the myth of how this got established is through an irrational fear of saturated fat. We've basically been told a lie. We've been told that saturated fats are going to kill us, when in actual fact, all the good quality evidence shows the exact opposite. And not only that, that the good quality evidence the findings have actually been, I I guess, swept under the carpet. They've been deliberately kept out of public view, including from scientists and medical doctors. So if we go back, there was a, I won't talk too long on this because I have talked extensively about them before, but there was two studies in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, the Sydney Diet Heart Study and the Minnesota Coronary Experiment. And they were both randomized controlled trials that looked at what happened when you removed saturated fat from the diet Mm -hmm. and replaced it with vegetable oils, seed oils. And what they both found was that cholesterol would go down, but mortality rates would increase. And unfortunately, while these studies were completed in 1973, the findings actually weren't published until 2013 and 2016, respectively. So, I mean, they they were completely swept under the carpet. This is an absolute, um, it should be a widespread scandal. Um, And when the investigators in one of the studies were asked why they didn't publish their results, they actually said, well, we didn't get the results we wanted. They actually deliberately, they, they didn't get 
the results that would support their hypothesis that they personally believed in. So they swept it under the carpet. And this is still happening today. We've got the $700 million publicly funded women's health initiative study. And that has actually found real harms for people going on low saturated fat diets. They found that there's, you know, increased problems, medical problems, cardiac disease, heart attacks, when people remove the saturated fat from their diet. And they've done their very best to obscure these findings and prevent them from ever seeing the light of day. So it's an absolute scandal. And I guess reflecting on this, the reason that we're scared of saturated fat is we're told that it will increase our LDL cholesterol level. And that's actually wrong on two levels. First of all, the best data we have shows that people with higher LDL levels live longer. Mm -hmm. On average, higher LDL level confers longevity. And number two, which is absolutely fascinating, is that there is no known mechanism by which saturated fats actually increase LDL cholesterol. Rather, there's known mechanisms by which seed oils reduce LDL cholesterol because they, they have these uh, chemicals called sterols. They're plant chemicals, phytochemicals, plant sterols, that our body will absorb thinking that it's, it can use it, but it can't actually assimilate it into the body, so it forces our cholesterol levels to lower. So when we talk about saturated fats increasing cholesterol levels, they're not increasing cholesterol levels physiologically. They're merely restoring them to a level. It's actually vegetable oils and seed oils, and they're one and the same, that artificially lower our cholesterol levels. And that's something really important. So if uh, any of your listeners out there and they get into an argument with a, or a discussion, a debate with anybody about saturated fats, ask them what the mechanism is by which saturated fats actually increase LDL levels. It'll be a, a, an interesting response. In terms of the seed oils, why are we recommending? I mean, one, I guess it's because we fear LDL and so it lowers it, but we also fear just lots of banter lately about polyunsaturated fatty acids being harmful. Is that one of the reasons why seed oils are less than ideal to be consuming? Great question, because this is a huge misunderstanding in the low carb carnivore ketogenic space. There's this belief that omega-6 fats, mm -hmm. which form the bulk of the, the oil, the fats in seed oils, are inherently harmful. Right. And that is demonstrably false. So allow me to explain. So we've got two types of polyunsaturated fat. So a polyunsaturated fat simply refers to having a double bond between two carbon atoms. And that double bond is chemically reactive. It can do what we call oxidize. And that oxidation um, can actually be absorbed into our body and can do us damage. Poly meaning many. So polyunsaturated fats have more than one of these double bonds. Monounsaturated fats like olive oil, which is constituted of 70% oleic acid, has only a single double bond and saturated fats don't have any of these double bonds. So what actually happens is that when we consume a seed oil, a vegetable oil, we're consuming fats which are prone to oxidation and the oxidation is actually what's doing the damage. It just so happens that most seed oils are actually uh, purport, disproportionately made of omega-6 fats. But it's not the omega-6 fats themselves that do the damage. It's the fact that whenever you have a, uh, a polyunsaturated fat, it oxidizes rapidly within hours of production, literally within hours. Wow. And when you're consuming it, you're consuming that oxidation. That's the bad news there. Now, the way to think about it is, have you ever heard of arachidonic acid? Yes, in school, a little bit. So arachidonic acid, is a, uh, a chemical that's formed from the omega-6s. And it can get turned into multiple other inflammatory uh, chemicals. So 
what this actually means is that uh, we've we've assumed that arachidonic acid can turn into leukotrienes, it can turn into thromboxane A2 and so on and so forth, prostaglandin, it must be bad for us. But in actual fact, the arachidonic acid is not inflammatory. It will only turn into these inflammatory substrates if there's an inflammatory trigger. If you've removed inflammatory triggers, that arachidonic acid will sit there quite happily and won't do anything bad at all. Now, for proof of this, we go to one of the doyens of low carb, Jeff Wallach, he was involved in a study that was published in 2019. And that looked at the fatty acid profiles in people who went on a low carbohydrate intervention versus people on high carbohydrate diets. And what they actually found was that the arachidonic acid level in the people on low carbohydrate diets increased. And this is hugely important to understand because every other inflammatory marker reduced. So it really goes to show that the reason the arachidonic acid was increasing was simply because it wasn't, you removed the inflammatory triggers and it wasn't being converted into these other downstream products that generate, cause inflammation that are associated with inflammation. The way to think about it is that omega-6 is an essential fatty acid. We need it for life. Without it, we die. The problem is that when we consume it from seed and vegetable oils, we consume it in an oxidized form. The best way to actually get it is from fresh food. So meat, so grass-fed meat, has got both omega-3 and omega-6. And if the omega-6 or any of the polyunsaturated fats in that meat becomes oxidized, that meat would be rancid. And we don't eat rancid meat. We don't have rotten food. So if you're getting your omega-6s and omega-3s, from natural food, then it's very unlikely to be oxidized. So that's a perfectly healthy way to get it. So fresh fish, don't have rotten fish. It, it's, really, it's really quite obvious. Whereas if you're having it in a bottle, that bottle's, you know, that's been sitting there for who knows how long. When I learned about the different seed oils in nutritional therapy school, I looked into how canola oils were made and they were heated I think six to seven times. And there's a certain threshold that they say that once that heat is past that amount, then it will get oxidized. But the way that they produce these canola oils specifically, the, the range was much higher than that threshold. And so I knew from school, um, these oils are not ideal because of the oxidation. And then also some of the sprays that they use on these plants, but it wasn't so much about the omega-6. Sure. We should eat more natural meats, and then, but in this community, we get scared, not about the oxidation necessarily, but because of the omega-6 level. So it's really interesting that you're bringing this up. So you mentioned canola oil. So it's interesting that you bring that up because that's actually the one vegetable oil or seed oil, it's really a seed oil, right. that actually has a reasonable amount of omega-3s in it, right. um, a two to one ratio. And when you look at the data, canola oil is really no healthier than any other seed oil. So it really speaks to the point. It's not the omega sixes and three ratio. It's the fact that you're consuming oxidized products. And this is why, because most oils, however, are highly, highly, they have a uh, bias towards having far more omega sixes that when we look at something called the fatty acid omega six to omega three ratio in your red blood cells, that people with a very high ratio are actually usually in far worse health. Mm. And that's simply because this ratio is a surrogate marker for right. seed oil consumption because most of the sixes that we have in our diet is from seed oils. So when you consume an oil, you actually absorb the oxidation products and those oxidation products get assimilated into the body. It right. can contribute to oxidized LDL, which we know is bad. And it's actually been shown to lead to fatty liver disease. We've got very good electron microscopy studies that show when you deliver oxidation stress to uh, mouse livers that you generate um, basically fatty liver. Uh, we've also got very good studies that show if you want to exacerbate that oxidation load from an oil, the best way to do so is with what we call glycemic instability. Basically have your sugar levels go up and down. In this regard, they've actually done studies where they've actually looked at what we call um, the oxidative stress that's delivered to endothelial cells, the cells that line the blood vessels. And they've found 
that fluctuations in blood glucose level are far more problematic than uh, persistently elevated but flat levels of blood glucose. And they did a really nice study. This was, uh, but what they did, they fed people oxidized oils and they had them stratified into three groups. Some of them were healthy, no blood glucose problems at all. Then they had well-controlled diabetics and then they had poorly controlled diabetics. And what they actually found was that in the non-diabetics and the well-controlled diabetics, that they could measure the oxidation entering the circulation and remaining in place for eight hours after consuming the food. Wow. However, in the people with poorly controlled diabetes, so they're having fluctuating blood sugar levels, and remember this is associated with extra oxidative stress, they found an increase in blood oxidation persisting for eight, uh, three days, 72 hours. So compare that, eight hours versus 72 hours. Right. And that only difference, they were having the same oxidation load in terms of oil, but they were having far, you know, their the blood sugar control was far, far worse. And there's this nexus between seed oils and diabetes and poor sugar control that a lot of people don't understand. So not only does the, uh, the diabetes make the oxidation damage from seed oils worse, but consuming the oxidation products makes your blood sugar level worse. It ends up in this little cycle. Right. So they did this lovely study back in 1965. It was the Rose Corn Oil Study. And that was uh, probably the first randomised controlled trial that actually showed harm from uh, vegetable and seed oils. They basically had a couple of different groups. They had an olive oil group. They had a corn oil group, which is a seed oil. And they had a saturated fat group. Uh, in the uh, saturated fat group, over the duration of the study, it went for two years, there was one death. And in the corn oil group, they had five deaths. So uh, the conclusion of the authors was that, you know, seed oils are really shouldn't be used, they shouldn't be recommended. And as you can predict, those findings were routinely ignored. But the really interesting findings from this study happens with when they discuss what happened to the individual participants. And they describe one case in particular who actually developed diabetes when he went on the corn oil and then they stopped giving the subject corn oil, the diabetes disappeared. And they, mm -hmm. they did this, uh, you know, no intervention, intervention. And they found that whenever they gave the subject the corn oil, his diabetes returned. And the way they were measuring it was with glucose in the urine. So when your blood glucose levels go extremely high, the kidneys can no longer hold all the sugar in your body and some excess sugar leaks into the urine. So glucose in the urine, and it's thought to probably be about 14 or 15 millimoles a litre in the blood that will lead to what we call this renal overflow. And what they actually, you know, this is very good evidence of extremely poorly controlled diabetes. So these case studies are very strong indicators that you can basically lead to somebody meeting the diagnostic criteria for diabetes by giving them seed oil and then reverse that by removing the seed oil. Right. So very, very strong links between uh, seed oils and diabetes. So with that thought then, bleeding that information into the carnivore community, if you eat meat only or mostly meat-based, if you eat the animals that ate foods and diets with some of the seed oils, some of the corn, that then those animals have higher PUFAs. And so then you are, you know, you'll struggle with the diabetes. All the studies you just mentioned will then continue on with the animals that you're eating. And so therefore we should just eat pasture raised, grass fed. Otherwise we will have higher levels of oxidation, higher levels of PUFAs, and that will then increase our diabetes, how carnivores tend to have higher A1Cs. And then it just furthers that belief of, oh my gosh, my blood sugar is going up. And is it yeah. the PUFAs from the chicken and pork? So there's a couple of really important points that you raise there. So first of all, grass-fed meat does have one very important advantage over uh, grain-fed meat, and that's to do with nutrition. So grass-fed meat will have better levels of vitamin K2. It will have better levels of vitamin D. It will have better levels of omega-3. So they've done some very interesting feedlot studies where they've actually taken uh, what they call um, grain-finished 
cattle. So they, they spend most of their life on lovely pastures and then they put them in a feedlot eating corn to fatten them up. And they do periodic studies where they uh, take a sample of their meat um, every week or so for the nine month period. And what you can see over a period of months is that you'll end up, you'll start out with a reasonably good level of omega-3 uh, within grass-fed uh, cattle. And over a period of time of exclusive grain feeding, that omega-3 will turn down to zero. So we know that uh, two thirds of the brain is fat and about 20% of that fat is actually an omega-3, a DHA fat. So omega-3 is really important. So if you're exclusively consuming grain-fed meat, then you may be missing out on some nutrients. So yes, there is an argument for grass-fed and pasture-raised meat. However, this whole notion that it's going to be generating oxidation and it's going to be inflammatory and then toxic and all of that, I don't think that bears scientific scrutiny. As long as you're making sure that you're getting your nutrients that you need from other sources and maybe you're having regular salmon for your omega-3 and right. you're having other saturated fat sources of food that are rich in vitamin D and so on and so forth, then there's no real reason why you must avoid having grain-fed meat. Most of my patients will tolerate grain-fed meat very well, but understanding that it does have some nutritional deficiencies when you compare it to pasture-raised meat. That's, a, that's the real reason why you go pasture-raised meat, not because of any you know, potential inflammation. Remember, if the meat isn't rotten, if it's not rancid, then the fats you're consuming are not oxidized. Non-oxidized omega-6 is right. not inherently inflammatory. Right. Remember the Bolex study. Arachidonic acid, an omega-6 byproduct, actually increases in states of low inflammatory stress. You also mentioned the HbA1c there yes. and how that tends to be higher or it can be higher in people on a carnivore diet. So here's two things. So first of all, recall that fluctuations and oscillations in blood glucose level are far more damaging than sustained flat elevations. And most of my carnivore patients will demonstrate superb glycemic stability. It might be a 0.2 or 0.4 higher than uh, before they started on average. But if you actually have a look at it, there'll be virtually no excursion. It'll be pancake flat. Number two, using HbA1c often falsely elevates what the average blood sugar is in a carnivore. So let me explain. So you've got a red blood cell and it's sitting in a soup that contains sugar molecules. And over the life of that red blood cell, there'll be a predictable attachment of glucose molecules attaching to that red blood cell. And that will happen in a rather predictable fashion. We say it's three months, but it's, usually, it's strongly biased towards the most recent six weeks of the red blood cell okay. lifespan. Now, the obvious factor that will increase the amount of sugar that attaches to a red blood cell over its life is the amount of sugar in the blood. But the other factor that a lot of people don't consider is the lifespan of the blood cell. Now, what causes blood cells to turn over quicker, basically to die and need replacing? Well, oxidative stress is a huge component of that. We know that people that have uh, conditions leading to oxidative stress like a G6PD deficiency and things like that, often commonly known as farvism, then they'll have a very short red blood cell lifespan. Their red blood cells will often die. They'll have something called hemolysis. So if you actually reduce oxidative stress, your red blood cells will live for longer. And when you measure the HbA1c, it will appear as your sugar level is higher because basically you're looking at a population of red blood cells that's had more time Right. for these glucose molecules to attach to it. And there's actually a way that we can assess this. So, so a reticulocyte is basically a new red blood cell. Um, it's a little bit different to normal red blood cells or mature red blood cells. It contains uh, a, a RNA and a slightly bigger. So we can actually measure the number of reticulocytes in your blood and that will tell us how many new red blood cells you're making. So if we assume that you're in a steady state with regards to what your actual hemoglobin and your red cell count is, then your reticulocyte count will actually indicate if there's any changes in the rate of turnover. 
So if your red blood cell number is staying the same and you can see your reticulocyte count, as in the number of new red blood cells that your body's having to generate is falling, that tells you that your red blood cells are living longer. And indeed, when I measure this on a lot of my patients, that is exactly what we see. The red blood cells are living longer and that artificially elevates the HbA1c. How do you test for the reticulocyte? Is it a marker that you can just test through your doctor? Absolutely. Okay. Um, how do I test for it? I write it on the form. <laughs> At the end of the day, wear a continuous glucose monitor. If you're, if you're worried about your HbA1c being too high, then if you wear a continuous glucose monitor, it's a little disc, it just sticks onto the back of your arm, right. then what you'll get is real-time measurements mm. over a 24-hour period for about two weeks, I think, in the States. I think yes. they, they last for 10 days, but in Australia, they for two weeks. And that'll be communicated wirelessly to your phone, and that will give you perfect information on the trend of your blood sugar levels. You don't always trust the absolute level, um, but it's the trend that yes. you're worried about. If you understand that variations in the sugar level are what generates oxidative stress, then if you've got a pancake flat trace, then you could really care less what your HbA1c is. Right. I know there's some people that don't really think anti-nutrients are that big of a thing where there are certain foods that will block and inhibit mineral absorption. There's a great study you brought up about corn oils and how they block um, certain minerals. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, that actually wasn't corn oil. That was actually corn itself. So this was oh, okay. a study published in 1979 by Solomon. And they looked at if they uh, absorption of zinc from a meal of oysters. And they first of all, they, uh, the way they assessed the absorption of zinc is they measured the zinc in the blood um, periodically after consuming a meal. And they could see, okay, if the zinc is ending up in your circulation, then it indicates that you are actually absorbing it. That's basically science. And what they found was that when they fed people oysters and black beans in the same meal, some of the chemicals, some of the phytic acid um, within the black beans would actually bind to the zinc and stop you absorbing the nutrients uh, within the oysters. And zinc absorption was reduced by 50% when you combine it with black beans. But the fascinating finding was when you combine oysters and corn tortillas, that the absorption of zinc was reduced 100%. 100%. 100%. Wow. So if you're out there and you're thinking, okay, I'm uh, these anti nutrients, you know, that, that's fine. I'm just going to, uh, you know, I'm not going to get any nutrient out of the corn tortillas. I accept that. I'm not going to get any zinc from them. So I'll just take it with the zinc supplement, what have you. Uh -uh. It's not, it doesn't work like that. Unfortunately, anti nutrient, anti nutrients don't just impact on the food that they're contained within, but they can impact on any other food ingested at the same time. Right. And I've seen that a lot. So I know that there are certain anti-nutrients even in teas and um, in coffees. And I see a lot of people drink their tea and coffee with their meats, which then can bind to iron and can bind to other minerals. And we don't think of these things when we're eating certain foods, we think we're being healthier. It's just like how spinach has a lot of oxalates and that will bind to the iron and so it's really really fascinating yeah well absolutely basically if you're having a food with anti-nutrients in it and people still if you do a quick google search for it you'll see that there's half a dozen vegan articles saying that oh anti-nutrients are actually not that bad for you and they'll try and spin it in a way that they're good but basically they're sucking the nutrition out of your food i honestly don't see how on god's green earth that anti-nutrients can be a good thing and if you understand that they, it's not just that food that becomes deficient in nutrient, it's anything it's consumed with. Right. Um, you can see that it, rise, it causes huge problems. And so I've recommended to some people that are really adamant about eating certain veggies, I'll say steam them. And then if anything, eat them by itself as a snack with no other food by it so that then hopefully you'll be able to absorb more of the nutrients from meat. And maybe there's a timing with the anti-nutrients in your system. I haven't really looked into that. I mean, and that's a logical response. And 
This is also if people are taking uh, heavy zinc supplements or copper or iron supplements mm. or what have you that, you know, for whatever reason. So a lot of my patients will be coming in and they'll be taking these supplements. And um, while, you know, zinc, copper and iron, they're not the same as anti-nutrients. Um, if you understand that they share absorption pathways and there can be competitive inhibition of absorption, um, if somebody is truly trying to uh, increase their iron levels, then it doesn't make sense that you consume it at the same time as a zinc supplement, which yeah. is just going to compete with that. So, um, you know, an understanding of nutrient absorption, I, I think, is very important. I just want to make one last point. Okay. I've sort of, I guess I've made my profile in the low carb movement, but people who have followed me will notice that over the last three or four years, I've actually um, increased my focus towards seed oils. And there was a 2020 paper published in the British Medical Journal that really explains why, um, you know, if you have uh, fructose containing carbohydrates, they will still damage the metabolism. And that, that's really not in doubt the carbohydrate insulin model, you know, that we know what that all is. But seed oils have really uh, avoided being held accountable for all the damage that they cause. So the, this part, study in 2020, it was a UK biobank study. It was a prospective study on over 195,000 people. And they basically looked at mortality and dietary factors. Now, number one, this is an associational study, epidemiology, so you can't prove causation. But I believe it is informative. And what they actually found that mortality, so they found that there was problems when you had too many seed oils in mm -hmm. terms of mortality association. They found that when you had too much carbohydrate, there was a problem with an increase in mortality. The interesting thing was, though, that they found that when seed oil consumption, a uh, percent of energy in the diet, exceeded 6 or 7%, then the seed oils were associated with more mortality than carbohydrates were. Now, if you consider this 6 or 7% and understand that in my country, the average Australian gets 13% of their energy from seed oils, you'll understand why this, is, why this is really the elephant in the room. The seed oils are, are really the big problem here. And I think that, you know, for most people, if uh, low-lying fruit, um, if you've got a choice of reducing carbohydrates in the diet or eliminating seed oils, on the balance of probabilities, you'd probably get better health benefits by eliminating seed oils. And just to reiterate what everything you've said with that is it's because the seed oils, not because of their omega-6, but that they are oxidized and that they cause inflammation within the body, which then can also increase your blood sugar levels. It's not because these seed oils are really high in omega-6. Correct. Okay. So the, the fact that they're high in omega-6 is why that we see these surrogate markers of the omega-3 to 6 fatty ratio and red blood cells being associated with problems, but that's an association. The yes. causation happens via oxidative stress, the oxidative stress making insulin resistance worse, the oxidative stress causing fatty liver disease, the oxidative stress contributing to small dense LDL. It's the oxidation stress that is the problem. So what are your thoughts about carbohydrates? There's a lot of people that do a carnivore diet and it's um, lots of athletes say, I need that burst of energy. I need to lift and I need carbohydrates. I require carbohydrates to do better at the gym at um, doing exercise. Do we need carbohydrates to be an athlete? Well, let's have a look at how this actually came about you know what why do we believe that carbohydrates are necessary it happens because in the 1960s scientists developed a technique um, of measuring glycogen in muscles and they didn't have much other technology but they figured out that your high power performance deteriorated when glycogen levels were depleted they also figured out that glycogen was made of glucose carbohydrates are made of glucose Therefore, it was obvious that if we just eat more carbohydrates, we have more glycogen, our high power, our anaerobic performance, our power performance, our strength performance is going to be better. And that was a paradigm which basically resulted from this one test, um, mm -hmm. the muscle biopsy for glycogen levels. And nobody ever questioned whether carbohydrates actually were needed to maintain 
glycogen levels because it seems so obvious. Right. You know, glucose is glucose is glucose. You know, we, we don't really understand the, the whole physiology, but we don't need to study it because, you know, it's plain as day. The fact is, it's not plain as day. The single piece of evidence on which this whole notion that you need to have carbohydrates for high level athletic performance hinges on glycogen stores. So in 2016, um, Jeff Bollock was again associated with a study where they published a paper on ultra marathon runs. And basically what they did, they had um, some of the ultra marathon runners were ketogenic and they were well keto adapted. They'd been doing it for months and they had high carbohydrate adapted athletes who were used to being high carbohydrate. And then they put them on a treadmill, they made them run a marathon. And before they got on the treadmill, they did a muscle biopsy and they measured their glycogen levels. And before they started, they actually found that the ketogenic athletes had exactly the same level of glycogen in their muscles as did the low carbohydrate athletes in the rest of the state. This is what you would predict. So the conventional theory is that after running a marathon, that the high carb athletes would have higher glycogen levels because they would be consuming carbohydrates for the race, so on and so forth. Um, what they actually found is that after the marathon, there was no difference in glycogen levels. And then after nutrient replenishment, in which the low carb athletes were given fat shakes and the high carb athletes were given carb shakes, two hours after recovery, there was again no difference in glycogen levels. It conclusively proves with biopsy level data, you, you, there's, you don't get any better experimental data than this, that glycogen stores are maintained on ketogenic diets in long-term keto adapted athletes. So then the question rises, well, if this is the case, then you should actually see maintenance of performance. So ketogenic athletes shouldn't have any deterioration of power. They should they should be able to generate the same level of peak force. So in 2018, McSweeney published a paper and basically they had high level athletes who were self-selected to one of two groups um, and they went on a ketogenic diet or a high carb diet for 12 weeks. And at the end of the time trial, they measured them, they did two tests. So one of them was a peak power. So they said, you know, they just measured what their peak power output was. And then another one was what they called a critical power test. So that went for three minutes and they had to sustain as high a level of performance as they could for three minutes. In both these tests of power and aerobic function, the key to Dr. Mason? Um, do you want to start? Sorry. Excellent. So, so predictably, based on the findings of this Volek paper, that there shouldn't be any deterioration in anaerobic or power performance in ketogenic athletes. And this was confirmed in a 2018 paper by McSweeney. So basically they had athletes who were um, allocated to either a ketogenic group or a high carbohydrate group for 12 weeks. And at the end of this adoption period, they were exercised on a time trial and at the end of the time trial, they had their peak power assessed and they had what's called the, a critical power test where it went for three minutes and they had to sustain as high a level of output as they possibly could. So a couple of interesting things. So on average, the ketogenic athletes did the time trial. They had a, a three minute better time. Mm -hmm. They also had higher peak power outputs and they did significantly better on the critical power test. So clear evidence that ketogenic diets not only do not impair anaerobic performance, but it appears to improve it. And there's multiple mechanisms why this is the case. So if you look at it like that, do these athletes need carbohydrate to have that level of performance? No, they do not. So then why do people say they feel better when they carb up a little bit before going to the gym, maybe having a tablespoon of honey um, some type of sugary, I don't know what, but they, they feel better and they feel like they know how much weight they can lift when they're eating just meat based or when they're adding the carbohydrates. Why do they feel better then? 
And I recall reading some research, it would have been probably 10 or 15 years ago, on uh, oral carbohydrates or even the taste of carbohydrates on something called rating of perceived exertion. Mm. So it may be that there's a, a chemical release, maybe there's a release of dopamine into the mesolimbic pathway that's actually making people actually um, feel that exercise is perhaps easier. But at the end of the day, when we actually put it to the test and we do you know, physical testing of uh, power outputs and performance, um, we don't see any difference in that. The only thing, I haven't actually looked at this, the data on that in a long time, and I haven't actually uh, had any patients who really come to me and strongly tell me that. So uh, I, I can only hypothesize that it's probably a psychological effect. I spoke with um, a exercise expert and he said similar things. He's not even a carnivore advocate, but he said a lot of it is nocebo. When somebody believes that they need carbs, they may perform better. And it's more of like a placebo effect. It takes at least four months, um, you know, and the data will show at least 12 weeks to keto adapt, but probably I think even longer um, before you're going to hit your straps uh, with performance on a ketogenic diet. Now, how do we know this? So when your body burns fat, it initially can turn it into ketones. But if you can't efficiently use the ketones and the cellular machinery for your body to use the ketones does take some time to upregulate, then you'll actually expel some of those excess ketones in your urine. Now, uric acid and ketones compete for excretion through the kidneys into the urine. So that means if you actually have elevated ketone levels, um, and that are leaving your body through the urine, they'll actually prevent some of the uric acid from also leaving the body. And that means the uric acid level will increase in your blood. So we can actually use the increase um, in uric acid levels to see whether you're keto adapted and then monitor that to see how long it takes to return back to baseline. And when we've actually done that, it takes at least 12 weeks. So from that, we can infer that keto adaptation for athletic performance takes at least three months, probably four to six months. What about sex hormone binding globulin testosterone? There's thoughts that if you eat no carbs and only eat meat, that um, your SHBG goes up and then therefore your testosterone drops. And that's why we need carbs again to support this area. So first of all, Sex hormone binding globulin absolutely is higher in people on carnivore diets. It does go up. We monitor this. We can see it. Um, it's, uh, it's very, very clear to see and very easy for us to see. So um, the question is, is this a problem? The mm -hmm. old thinking used to be that sex hormone binding globulin would bind to testosterone and that would prevent the testosterone from being act inact active. So the truth is, we now know that sex hormone binding globulin bound to testosterone still has physiological activity. So this fear about elevated sex hormone binding globulin um, basically preventing your testosterone from having any physiological effect, that's not true. Further to that, if we have a look at what we call the lean mass hyperresponder phenotype, so I'm sure your listeners will be familiar with Dave Feldman, so that's when people go on ketogenic style diets and their LDL cholesterol goes up, their triglycerides go down, their HDL cholesterol goes up. Yeah. So as a part of that phenotype, I add sex hormone binding globulin. So it's my observations that when people start having those high levels of LDL, almost always they're having a very high level of sex hormone binding globulin. So it's not just isolated to carnivores, but I suspect that because carnivore is such a, a low carbohydrate and can be a high fat diet, that we're seeing that lean mass hyperresponder phenotype. And I certainly don't see any problems with that. There's multiple things that make sex hormone binding globulin going up and down. But if I'm seeing it as a picture of that improved lipid status, that higher LDL, uh, higher HDL, and lower triglycerides and also LDL, then that does not impair athletic or physical performance at all. So regardless of the SHBG then, when people say that their testosterone has tanked on carnivore, any thoughts on that? I've never seen that. So <laughs> what we do see is that people with chronic inflammatory conditions, and one of the most common reasons people go on a carnivore diet is to manage inflammatory bowel disease. 
Well, these kind of conditions are usually associated with very low testosterone levels. In actual fact, I'll always do um, testosterone testing, including sex hormone binding globulin, mm. on my patients with inflammatory bowel disease, uh, and it's often low. So I, I don't, I've not seen any data like that. I haven't seen that in my clinic. And that's certainly not my experience. The usual pattern we see is that when people eliminate inflammatory conditions, that their testosterone levels are restored to where they should be. My guess, and this is totally speculation, but Dr. Sean Baker three years ago shared his markers and his testosterone was low, but this was also when he was kind of new to the carnivore diet. I think he's been on it for four years now. And so then I think everyone went out and tested their testosterone and I'm sure some people's it is low, but I don't know how many of them have tested their testosterone. Well, understand that testing testosterone is not a simple concept. So right. Testosterone has what we call diurnal variation and, and it will spike. So if you measure it at different times of the day, you'll have a different level. Yes. So you need to make sure that it's being tested. I always do request my patients have their blood tested in the morning fasted mm -hmm. state so that it's reproducible as possible with consecutive tests. So you can't just be looking at serum testosterone in isolation right. if you're not taking into account the diurnal variations. And there's other factors that can involve. So I'd be very reluctant to comment on anybody's testosterone without knowing the full story, least of all Sean's. Sure. And I talked to Dr. Baker recently, and he told me that since that three-year test, um, in the, the last few ones he's te tested, all the testosterone markers are high and he feels fine and he is not worried. But I think it was that one you know, people just grab snippets of a story and that's what they get scared of. And he made sure to explain to me in my community that the, his testosterone of more recent times are all very high and they're very normal. So that would match my clinical experience. Yes. What about thyroid markers? You know, there's a thought where if you don't have enough uh, carbohydrates, then you're not knocking on insulin's door, your insulin gets too low and that really impacts your thyroid markers. So your T3 drops, your TSH may be imbalanced. Well, first of all, we often do see T3 going lower. So T3 is the most active thyroid hormone. Yeah. And the reason for this is that it becomes more effective. So in the same way that your insulin levels will reduce when the resistance to insulin is removed because you don't need persistently high levels of insulin if it's working better. If your thyroid hormone is working better, if your T3 is working better, you simply don't need as high levels. And if you understand that, if you understand that concept, then you go back and have a look at the TSH. And TSH stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. Now, the way this actually works is that if your body perceives that it doesn't have enough T3 being active, it will send a signal back to part of the brain called the anterior pituitary gland, which will then release thyroid stimulating hormone. So in the state of a, your body detecting a deficit of T3 activity, it will increase the TSH. So higher TSH means less active thyroid. Usually what we'll see is that even if the TC, T3 is going down, we will also see the TSH going down at the same time. And the TSH going down indicates that the body is perceiving an increase in thyroid activity. So this whole concern about T3 going down, it must mean that uh, your thyroid is less active, that it doesn't reflect the reality. It's all about uh, the effectiveness of that T3. And then you go back to the TSH and have a look at the rel relative effect. Now, it's also hugely complicated because a lot of people on carnivore have autoimmune diseases. They often, they often find themselves on the carnivore diet because of autoimmune disease. And the most common autoimmune disease we have is something called Hashimoto's thyrotoxicosis. What this means is that your immune system is attacking this thyroid gland that's sitting in the base of your neck on the front here. Now, what actually happens is when you have an active autoimmune attack, then the preformed thyroid that's stored in the thyroid gland will be released. And if you have a pulsatile attack on the thyroid, you'll have a release of thyroid hormone in a pulsatile manner. So there'll be periods of thyroid 
overactivity when you're having this periodic activation of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Mm. In the longer term, once you've destroyed most of the thyroid gland, you actually end up suppressing the body's ability to secrete thyroid hormone. Basically, the gland's been irreversibly destroyed and you'll end up uh, flicking over into a state of persistent thyroid underactivity. But if you understand that this can complicate people's interpretation of uh, T3, T4 and TSH, and you also need to bear in mind, do you have active disease? You, if you do thyroid antibody testing, you can often detect that you've actually got an autoimmune condition and that autoimmune condition can lead to periodic hyperactivity, hyperthyroidism, followed by persistent hypothyroidism. So oh, periodic overactivity followed by persistent underactivity. So it, it's not as simple as people would think. You can't just look at T3 and say, my thyroid's doing this. Right, right. And I agree. I mean, my T3 has gone down compared to when I was not carnivore, but I feel fine. My TSH is lower within the range, but on the lower end, and my T3 has gone down and I do not believe I'm clinically hypothyroid, but there have been remarks that I am just because my marker was under two for my T3. And I just think it's, I have more energy than ever and I'm producing ketones and I feel well. And I think that's a big indicator of health is how you feel and all the other markers that are with the T3. But again, on the internet, so many people have said, if a marker, if your T3 is under like 2.5, that means that you are hypothyroid. Yeah, you, you simply can't make those kind of arbitrary claims without backing it up with evidence. And I've never seen any evidence. Right. Um, you just talked about autoimmune and we talked offline a little bit about dairy. Some people worry on a carnivore diet, if they're not consuming dairy, that they may be deficient in calcium, that that may further exacerbate osteopenia, osteoporosis. Thoughts on well, dairy? Well, dairy is a double-edged sword. So I'm going to, uh, I guess, indulge myself a little bit. Uh, I got this little book recently. So it's, uh, it's basically a report by the Medical Research Council. The Privy Council, uh, I'll just hold it up so you can uh, see the title there. So this was published in 1931. And what it is, uh, Studies of Nutrition, the Physique and Health of Two African Tribes. And this is an absolutely fascinating book because what they did, uh, they went... Uh, this was uh, English scientists. The, they went to Africa. This was back in the late 20s. And they came across two tribes. So one of them was a chiefly carnivore tribe, which we know to be the Maasai. They consume a lot of meat and a lot of dairy. Mm -hmm. And they found an adjoining tribe called the Akakuyu, um, who was chiefly vegetarian. And there was a little bit of intermixing between these tribes and so marriages and things like that. So genetically, they were fairly similar. So I'm going to read out uh, just a summary of their results. So physical measurements showed that full-grown Maasai male is on average five inches taller and 23 pounds heavier than the full-grown male cuckoo. And his muscular strength, as determined by the dynamometer, is 50% greater. Marked differences were found in the incidence of disease in the two tribes, bony deformities, dental caries and anemia, pulmonary, pulmonary conditions and tropical ulcer being much more prevalent among the Akaku. On the other hand, intestinal stasis and rheumatoid arthritis were more common amongst the Maasai. Oh, fascinating. Now, so the take home message, I guess, is that a uh, meat and dairy diet on average leads to you being far healthier, far stronger, far more robust uh, than a vegetarian diet. But the interesting thing is about this uh, intestinal stasis, constipation, and rheumatoid arthritis, which is an autoimmune disease, being more common in the Maasai. And this comes back to two things. So, have you ever heard of something called casomorphine? Yes. So this is a chemical, it's, a, it's basically an opiate-like peptide that's found in dairy. And if anybody has ever prescribed morphine, uh, when I was in medical school, we were taught that the, the hand that writes the script for an opiate also writes a script for a laxative. 
Why? Because opiates cause constipation. So this isn't very well known, but it is very obvious to a lot of my patients who are constipated that when they eliminate dairy from the diet, you're removing this constipatory effect of the casomorphine. So absolutely dairy contributes to constipation. And I actually first learned this from uh, Dr. David Unwin uh, from the UK. So he was discussing with me his patient experience and he had identified that in his patients as well. And this is what I was able to figure out mechanistically. Now, number two, 80% of the protein fraction within dairy is something called casein. And casein can cross-react. It has cross-reactivity with gluten, which we know can be an autoimmune trigger. So there's increasing evidence that dairy in vulnerable individuals uh, can trigger autoimmune issues, the likes of rheumatoid arthritis. And this is why many patients, when they eliminate gluten and dairy from their diet with autoimmune disease, they improve significantly. And I would also make the point that back in the 1920s, these Maasai weren't getting their milk from the supermarket. It wasn't pasteurized. It wasn't homogenized. It was natural milk straight from the cow. So, and it, you know, and it was A2. So people who think that you can get raw milk and uh, A2 milk, and that's going to avoid any potential um, adverse effects of dairy consumption, it, it's not borne out by the science. And having said that, it's science from 1931. Um, but this is the, in my mind, it's uh, very suggestive. And when we have a look at the mechanisms, we do see that molecularly there is cross-reactivity between casein and between gluten. And when we have a look at constipation, we know that casomorphine and opiate type peptide is absolutely found in dairy. So certainly we've got some uh, epidemiological evidence and we've got mechanistic data to back it up. My clients, um, a lot of them have autoimmune illness and they have a lot of gut issues. So some of them really want to add back dairy and they'll start with the raw dairies and they still cannot tolerate it. So I would say majority of my clients, while they would love to consume dairy, it doesn't matter how high of quality dairy is, they cannot tolerate it. So I would say well, in my practice, it's the same thing. Some dairy is much better tolerated. So fermented dairy Yes. Uh, and some of your listeners are probably going to be familiar with the autoimmune protocol diet, AIP diet, and they have understood quite well that fermented dairy is better tolerated. Um, it's not perfectly tolerated in everybody, but yogurt is basically the go-to. But the thing you have to be aware of is that if you have a look at the ingredients label on a lot of Greek yogurts now, they'll have their ingredients and then they'll have added milk solids. So mm -hmm. after the fermentation process, which has actually um, made these uh, proteins and stuff a little bit less reactive, then they go and add in a whack of milk solid again that hasn't had the benefit of that fermentation and that then reintroduces the uh, immunogenicity to it. So uh, what I advise to my patients and Interestingly enough, one of my patients actually educated me on this, so you can actually never stop learning from your patients, um, is that check the yogurt, make sure that it doesn't have any added milk solids. Mm -hmm. And if it's tolerated, it's tolerated. If it's not, unfortunately, it's not. But that's the safest place and the first place that you go for with dairy. What about calcium concerns then on a carnivore diet? We don't really see calcium. I mean, calcium's in lots of different foods. And you know, there's a whole lot of people banging on about having crushed eggshells and dairy and all of that. And the simple fact is people on dairy-free diets, if you're having a, a lot of other animal foods, you know, you will be getting enough calcium and you don't need to have crushed eggshells. You don't need to be having dairy. It's not a problem. I've actually documented in dozens of patients reversal of osteoporosis on dairy-free diets. So it's not necessary. Um, the interesting thing that I just talked briefly about osteoporosis, what most people don't realize is that 40% of the dry weight of bone is actually protein uh, collagen. So when we're trying to restore bone health, you need the basis of a high protein diet. And we've got randomized controlled trial evidence from 2002 by uh, Beth Dawson Hughes from memory um, that demonstrated over a three year period reversal of osteoporosis in postmenopausal females and elderly males 
um, with nutritional intervention alone with the requirement that they be on a high protein diet. So uh, protein has actually been shown to increase calcium absorption as well. Um, when we have a look at the amount of calcium coming out in the urine, it's much lower mm. when people are consuming more protein, indicating that there's more calcium retention within the body. Okay. Do you have a preference with macros? Um, have you seen with your patients where some, you know, there's a lot of talk about higher fat is the way to eat carnivore, or some people are like, you don't need added fat if you have some fat on your body. I'm a very simple man. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't, I couldn't even tell you what macros I eat. I, have, I, I couldn't even tell you within 10 or 15%. I really genuinely have no idea. Okay. Um, my, my approach is I eat food that's packaged naturally. Yes. Like I choose fatty cuts of meat and I deliberately leave the fat on. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't go out of my way to add extra fat in. I don't drizzle oil and I don't cook in butter or anything at all like that. So I just have naturally fatty cuts of meat. Okay. So it's interesting. You're probably familiar with the story of uh, Wilhelmer Stefansson, yes, who was yeah. the Arctic explorer. So when he came back and, you know, they did this study and nobody believed him that he could remain perfectly healthy on a, on a meat-based diet. So they put him in a hospital and said, here you are, only eat meat. And basically for 12 months, he and a colleague only ate meat. Over that 12-month period, there was a time of about a week where he developed um, significant nausea mm. and unrelenting diarrhoea. That was in response to the study investigators eliminating fat from his diet and having him only consume lean meat. So we often do see um, reports, so I think Joe Rogan will talk about this disaster pants um, going on a, on a carnivore style diet. So what I do notice is that if people aren't having fatty enough cuts of meat, and that can be hard um, because our whole food system here is predicated on having lean cuts of meat right. because that's what people want because they've been told that's healthier. So a lot of people, when they first go into a carnivore diet, um, they're probably not consuming fatty enough cuts of meat. They're a little bit afraid of having all the fat on the lamb chops on and so forth. They're not having the pork belly. And I think that's a likely a significant contributor mm. to the diarrhea that some people are experiencing. And again, it takes the point that we can really learn a lot from the historical medical literature, you know, from what happened with Wilhelmus Stefans, and this is, you know, decades and decades ago. Another thought in the community is our brains are naturally fueling off glucose as energy. So why tax the cortisol and tax gluconeogenesis to convert protein to sugars? Why not just feed your body a small portion of glucose, maybe 130 grams, 150 grams a day so that you don't tax your body? I mean, this really has no biological basis. So children are born in a state of ketosis. This is when their brain is developing. So we have to ask ourselves, why are children born in a state of ketosis? It's because the uh, fatty acids can't cross the blood-brain barrier. And in actual fact, if we were to metabolise fatty acids in the brain, that would be generating oxidative stress that could be potentially harmful for the brain. So it's much better that we actually have ketones cross the blood-brain barrier that can then be re-assimilated into tissue, remembering two-thirds of the brain is fat. So we know that children are born in a state of ketosis. They, their brains are using ketones to build the structure. Their brains are using ketones for energy. So this notion that we naturally require glucose um, really defies logic. So when children are being exclusively breastfed at the start of their life and their brains are undergoing the most rapid stage of growth that they'll ever have, you know, they're doing that on ketones. So how can we then turn around and argue that, you know, the carbohydrates are hugely necessary? They, these children are in ketosis. Um, there's a very interesting study, George Cahill, a starvation study, um, where basically he had a, a man um, water fast for 40 days. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that period of time, he had quite high serum ketone levels and pretty low glucose levels. So then they said, well, what happens um, if we inject him with insulin and bring his low glucose levels even lower. And if you ask a doctor that, what would happen now today, they'd say, well, he would die. 
So what actually happened is they, they did the experiment. <laughs> this is a long time ago for <laughs> ethics committees. And his blood glucose level fell below one, which by all intents and purposes, according to modern medical science, would have him in a coma at death's door. He remained perfectly cognitively intact, completely symptom free. Wow. What did happen though, that the high level of ketones in his blood fell, indicating that the brain was then using the ketones for energy. We have very clear evidence that the brain can function perfectly well on ketones. Even in somebody when we basically drive glucose down to levels that would, in a normal person who's not keto adapted, would kill them, right. they can maintain their brain function perfectly well with ketones. Uh, we've got, you know, no amount of opinion will overturn this experimental evidence. This whole myth that because brains can use carbohydrates for energy that they need carbohydrates for energy makes absolutely no sense well the beautiful thing about children is that their metabolisms haven't been damaged so they can tolerate carbohydrates much better right. than the metabol metabolically damaged adult and they have the capacity to re-enter ketosis much much quicker than yes. most adults do so within hours even after a carbohydrate meal, a young child will be back into ketosis. So it's certainly, you know, carbohydrates, and I, I probably shouldn't talk too much about young children, given uh, what happened with uh, our friend, Professor Timothy Noakes. Um, but I will say that, you know, children do have a capacity to handle non-sugar, as in uh, fructose-free carbohydrates, without any real issues in most cases and they will enter ketosis much quicker than adults will and ketosis is actually what allows you to build the brain if you understand that the brain tissue the brain structure actually basically derives from um, ketone bodies that have crossed the blood brain barrier then you'll understand the benefits of being in ketosis for a developing brain um, lately, people have been saying if you do carnivore ketogenic diets long term, your insulin drops way, way too low, and then your body becomes super fat adapted. Your cells do not want any glucose because you are supremely fat adapted. So any little bit that converts from protein to through gluconeogenesis, that's trying to knock on your cells, the body's like, no, I don't want it. So then it gets converted. Um, then it goes to the liver and then it produces fatty acids and triglycerides. And so the thought is that with this really, really low insulin, um, that almost look like type one diabetics, that these people, their markers start getting, they're moving in the wrong direction. So their triglycerides go up, their A1C goes up. And so the thought has been that we need a carb cycle for long-term carnivores, that carnivore is a short therapeutic tool, but long-term we need to introduce either carbs or have days of just lean meats, like just two pounds of chicken breast and no fat so that we can stimulate insulin enough. Otherwise we become overly fat adapted in a harmful way. I've got multiple patients who have been on carnivore for a while. I've never seen that. And when I say a while, years and years. Okay. Um, I've never seen any scientific evidence that would support that. And I suspect there's a couple of logical fallacies in that explanation. So first of all, you need insulin to assimilate protein into your body. And that's why when you consume protein, you will get a postprandial rise in insulin. So sure, you Carnivores may have low fasting insulin levels, but it's never zero. As long as the pancreas is working, the body will still secrete it and they will still be requiring uh, secretory insulin function to deal with the protein contained within their meals. So this uh, it's not a matter of, oh, the pancreas stops getting used, therefore the pancreas fails. It doesn't happen. The pancreas is still being used. It's just rather than shoving all the sugar into fat stores, the insulin is serving its purpose more to put the protein into muscle and bone and other lean tissues necessary for health. Uh, I've never seen any anything like that either clinically or in the literature. It just does not make any sense. And I would say the same. So in my practice, the only people I see with higher triglycerides that it hasn't really come down much from when they were eating like the standard American diet are people that still are metabolically 
challenge. So either they're maybe eating too much or too often, or they're eating off plan, but it's never with the people that are fully healed. Those people, I do see all the markers come down, especially the triglycerides and the A1C, as we discussed, may be a little bit higher, but that may be okay in context. But I guess one other thing to consider too is LADA, latent autoimmune diabetes of adulthood or, okay. or MODI. Um, this is an autoimmune diabetes. At least 10% of people diagnosed as type 2 diabetes actually have an autoimmune component mm. where their immune system will attack the beta islet cells of their pancreas and prevent it from secreting insulin. And it may be that people with uh, insulin levels that are falling too low have simply been undiagnosed oh, right. um, autoimmune diabetics. I'm on the same page with you on so many things that you brought up. And I love that you just bring in the science, you talk about your patients and then old books and old contexts to just make what seems like nonsense in carnivore make a lot of sense. Um, where can people find you, your lectures? Uh, where can people, if people wanted to work with you, are they able to work with you? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I'm on Twitter. So I do some online consulting and the link is through my Twitter handle. I've got a YouTube channel uh, where I periodically put uh, lectures up. So just look for Dr. Paul Mason on YouTube. And I'm also uh, my close friend, uh, Rob Taylor, runs the website Low Carb Down Under. Mm. And that's got a fantastic YouTube channel. And we have uh, a lot of great lectures on the Low Carb Down Under channel as well. That's through Rob Taylor. So, uh, you know, check out the lectures. There's, there's lots of people in this field. Everybody's advancing it. Um, I mean, I, I'm just a little cog in the wheel, I guess, because I, I'm learning off other people as well as, learning, you know, the research I'm reading, other people have actually done that. Um, so we're all learning off each other and hoping to advance the science. And, uh, yeah, so just dig into all the lectures. And if we can help anybody, then it makes it all worthwhile. Well, thank you so much. This has been a pleasure and I will put all your information in the show notes. So thank you again for joining me. This has been very, very insightful. I'm so glad we talked about the PUFAs and just put it to rest. Seed oils may be very toxic, but not in the way that we have been scared in the carnivore community. Grain fed meats are okay. It's not that they are oxidized. You may want more nutrition. And I do believe eating a rainbow of meats is ideal. So thank you for clarifying that. I think that has been a big misconception in our community. Judy, the pleasure has been all mine. I hope that this conversation was insightful for you. I hope you realize the nuance about PUFAs and seed oils and saturated fats, and then even the fears of low thyroid function or T3 markers and SHBG. All of these things are so nuanced when your diet is so different from the standard American diet that then marks blood work based on those averages. Why are we measuring ourselves based on metrics that were meant for people that do not follow a meat-based or ketogenic diet? It's something to really think about. In terms of PUFAs, if you are eating mostly grain-fed meats, it may not be an issue other than possible nutrient deficiencies, but you can have some salmon and take care of that issue with omega-3s. The goal is to eat mostly meat-based as it's the most nutrient-dense foods, but we don't have to worry about the actual animal's diet because those levels of omega-6s in the animals are not what's getting you sick. I hope this conversation brings a lot of context and I hope it gives you empowerment to keep going on a meat-based diet or a meat-only diet. Okay, guys, make sure to eat a lot of meat. Take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you guys later. Bye, guys. Bye.